Hello and welcome to Things That Fall Out Of My Head. Today we are looking at episode 2 of the Mandalorian project build. So today we're going to be looking at the flak vest. Uh, we saw it very briefly in the previous video. So today let's look at it in a little bit more detail. So to start off with, I had a pattern that I was originally using for a different project. It was going to be for an Assassin's Creed Odyssey costume piece. I think it's called the Traveler's Robes, something like that. It's essentially a tunic made up of uh, different sewn together elements, make it look quite patchwork. But because I wanted it to have a little bit more structure, I designed this pattern. Uh, it's a very simple two-piece pattern uh, that's mirrored front and back. And this itself was designed from a modified Simplicity 2333, I think it was. I basically took the front and back of the coat, uh, resized them, uh, took off the lapels, redid the armholes to make it into an over-the-head tunic. And the key there was trying to get it so that the head hole was big enough for me to be able to put it on, but not so big that it left a really open section at the neck. However, when it came to using this pattern for the flak vest, I realised that the shoulders were a little bit too broad. On the original pattern, the garment came out to the points of my shoulders, whereas because this item was going to have to have armour pieces hung on it, it, the, the shoulders were just that little bit too wide. It would have made the armour pieces stand out a little bit too far. So I went back to the drawing board and took away some material on the front and the back side of the armholes to make the shoulder strap a little bit thinner. I kept the neck part roughly the same and I also took off maybe an inch or two from the bottom of the, the pattern itself. This was because initially the pattern was designed for something that was going to be more flexible so it could come down as far as my, my belt level and I'd still be able to bend at the waist. However, because what I'm making now is going to be much thicker, much more rigid, I need it to finish a little bit higher, maybe just under my rib cage. Because if you leave it any longer than that, you're going to find that it starts to buckle up when you start bending forwards or moving around in any way. And this is a principle that applies to a lot of uh, not just modern armour pieces, but also historical pieces. They, they tend to finish higher up than perhaps you'd think they would, just to allow for that range of movement. So what you can see here is the inner part, the, the core of the vest, if you like, along with the modified pattern pieces that I made. Uh, this is designed just to give it a really strong central core that I can build off of and uh, build some real structure into. I thought I'd just quickly compare the pattern that I'll be using for the flak vest against the original one that I put together, just so we can see the difference. There's not a huge amount, but it does make a lot of difference when it comes to mobility, raising your arms, moving your torso around. So it was just a, a sliver there taking off the back side. The um, collar at the back was left exactly as it was but there was just a small piece removed from the bottom edge. Similarly, when it came to the front piece, there wasn't really a lot I changed in the neckline. I think I brought it up very, very slightly, but that was just to make sure that I could still get my head through it. And again, taking a little bit off the front of the shoulder to allow your arms to move forward a little bit more easily. And again, shortening the waistband slightly just to bring it up so it's a bit more comfortable for bending forwards. So in the state that you could see it just then, the pattern was constructed with this material. It's a very thick, uh, unbleached, undyed cotton denim. Uh, it's supplied by a company called Broftmill.co.uk here in the UK. It's a really sturdy, dimensionally stable fabric. I use this a lot whenever I'm building something that needs some rigidity to it, a little bit of extra strength. So that inner core that we were looking at before was just two layers of that denim put together and then stitched at regular intervals to help give it a little bit more rigidity. This is going to be the outer and inner fabric that I'm using for the flak vest. Again, it's a denim, a little bit lighter weight, it's got a little bit of a stretch to it, but not too much. And it was just very simply dyed with Dylon machine wash. I think the colour was stone off the top of my head. So onto the actual construction here, I've got a layer of very heavyweight batting material which has been applied to the inside of the shell which was made from our lighter weight denim and all we're going to do is put these together as if we were making another copy of the vest. So for both the back and the front we have them pinned together down the centre seam with that batting in place so that when they're sewed together we can open them out, stitch them together and put them on top of the core that we've already got. Therefore, the piece will be that much thicker and it'll be that much stronger when I'm trying to hang the 3D printed elements off of it. So what's going to give this the inherent strength that I need? 
is that when you layer up fabrics and you ask them to bend around a form like uh, someone's body if they're wearing it is that multiple layers will try and move against each other they'll try and slide over each other that's because with increasing layers of fabric you're asking the inner fabrics and outer fabrics to contract or expand at different rates to one another so if we attach all of these layers together around the edges or at different points across the surface you're preventing those layers from moving against one another you're, you're effectively asking everything to stay where it is and that's what's going to give this some extra strength so as we can see in the time lapse as well as sewing together the two front and two back pieces down the center to create a full back and front i'm also sewing these together over the shoulder pieces just as i did with the the core test fitted earlier on the mannequin with his very attractive t-shirt So once this layer was together, I had to go in and start debulking some of the seams. Now this isn't something you'll necessarily need to do on every project, but with something like this where I'm layering up a lot of very thick materials and some extra batting in there, then I've got to start taking out any unwanted bulk because as good as my sewing machine is, and it's a real trooper when it comes to heavy duty materials or lots and lots of layers. I've really got to help it out here and try and take out as many extra layers that I don't need as I can. As a result here, I'm taking out the seam allowance of the batting material, and this would normally just be folded back flat, pressed, and then left in place. But when it comes to attaching a bias binding to this later, I don't really want all of these extra layers around certain points because it's gonna make it look quite lumpy and it's gonna make it a lot harder for me to sew, which, we will see later on kinda happened anyway so with these out of the way i went in and pressed all of my seams um, i also clipped the very ends of each seam to try and remove a little bit more of that bulk what's really nice working with 100 percent cotton or denim or anything like that is it's very tolerant to high heat so i can just whack the temperature up on the iron use a lot of steam and it really helps me get everything lay flat, especially when layering up so many different pieces of fabric. Time for a quick test fit. So let's take that outer shell with the added layer of batting in it and just add it over to the core that I'd done earlier. This is really just to make sure that none of my measurements are really far out. There's nothing that looks to be off. As long as everything seems to be matching up at this stage, then we should be good to go. Now, I'm just double checking the width at the back here, because as I mentioned earlier, when you start layering these things up, they have a tendency to want to bend and conform at different rates. So this is just to make sure when I start pulling everything together, everything's gonna be generally in the right place, and then we'll go on to actually attach these two layers together. Which is what we're doing here in some incredibly sped up footage. I can't quite remember how long this took to actually pin in place. But what I'm doing is attaching the double layered core to the shell fabric. And it's really important at this stage to make sure that when you assemble it, it's assembled flat. You don't want to be trying to pin this together to achieve some kind of curve. In, in other projects, uh, for sleeves, for certain other things, then yeah, you might want to get a, a natural curve in there when you're pinning it together. You might want some kind of expansion or contraction at a seam. But at this stage, we just need to make sure that all of the edges match up everything is lined up correctly and when we put it on the mannequin again it's going to act as one piece now we're going to be adding some more stitching to this later to help with that rigidity and with the piece keeping its shape but for now it's just all about going all the way around the edge making sure everything is stitched in place together and this sort of plays into the vision that i had when i was designing this piece it was something akin to a modern flak vest that i had in mind so that even without the armor plates on it, it still looked like something substantial. I, I almost had it in the back of my mind that I wanted it to be a piece where it would stand up on its own. If you were to take it off and put it on the table, it would be able to stand up under its own construction and really have some rigidity to it and, and, and some weight to it. God, that was a lot of pins needed for this.
And there we have it. We have the outer shell with the added layer of batting and the inner denim layers that are going to create that extra support. So I'm just having a quick check round to make sure nothing's majorly out. So back to the mannequin for another quick test fit. And you'll see here compared to earlier when it was just the two layers of denim stitched to one another. Now we have these extra couple of layers, you'll see how much more the piece wants to lay flat. Those sides want to spring forwards rather than conform as they did before. Now it's, it's still reasonably flexible at this point. I'm very easily able to bring these round into the place where I'm going to need them when it's finished. But it's just got that little bit more structure to it. And while we're here, let's have a little test fit with the 3D printed chest pieces. Just wanting to make sure before I go any further that everything fits where it should and there's enough space around it that I'm, I'm, I'm happy with the aesthetic. I really don't like armor vests where the armor itself either hangs off the bottom of it or reaches the very bottom of the piece. It just doesn't, doesn't sit right to me. So we've got a, a decent little border around each armor piece just to show that there is a flak vest underneath it. And uh, it, to me, it looks like it should. From here, it's time to add some more lines of stitching to this thing. And this is going to have two purposes. First of all, it's going to be a decorative element, which on reflection with the armor pieces in place, you're really not going to be able to see much of, but it's a detail that I wanted to include. And secondly, it's going to keep all those layers of fabric together. So as I mentioned earlier, we don't want these layers of fabric trying to move across each other at different rates. If we do, they're going to start pulling against each other, especially at the edges. And over time, that can cause some issues around the edges of pieces like this. As with many things in this build, I kind of went by eye on this one. Um, I put in a couple of lines at the shoulder just as a, a sewing guide for my first line. I then thought maybe a couple of diagonal lines on the chest would, would look good and it would help make that area a little bit more stable for when I come to punch holes in it or whatever I'm going to do. Uh, and as you can see there, I suddenly decided that maybe I should measure these things and have some way of replicating it on the other side of the vest. Even then, it was kind of just making it up as I went along. I decided, hey, maybe a ruler's width from the centre and then two ruler's widths after that might look good. Uh, let's maybe put in another one. There we go. Back to the sewing machine again, and it was time just to put in all of the lines I just marked out. I, I didn't put it on camera, but I went across and made the same markings on the other half of the front. And here I'm just sewing those in, as well as some other ones I put in some extra lines at the shoulder. I used the outside edge of the underarm part to put in parallel lines of stitching that would just act as a little bit more interest. Even though I knew how I was planning to close the vest so these would be a little bit lost under what was going to come later, but again it all adds to this quilting effect that you get so that it helps everything remain as stable as possible. It's one of my buzzwords when I'm doing things like this is everything needs to be over-engineered, stitched together, held in place so that nothing moves and it all remains where it should be. With all these stitching lines in place, hopefully we can see when I stand this back up, everything just looks that little bit more solid. That little curve in the chest piece there is just a little bit more defined and shows that we're going in the right way. Just after this, it was time to make the lining for the piece was constructed in the same way as the outer shell, however without the layer of batting. We weren't going to need that extra padding in the lining. This was very simply put together, attaching the two halves at the front, two halves at the back, stitching them down the centre, and then once again attaching them at the shoulders. So effectively I had another third copy of this vest. Once the lining was complete, it's back to attaching everything together again. So exactly as we did with the front outer shell, I'm now pinning together the lining to the main body of the vest and pinning it all the way around. And again, this is just about trying to stop these different layers of fabric expanding at different rates. So the whole thing is going to be sewn around the outside edge again. As you can see in the footage there, I recommend you have a podcast or something to watch while you're doing this because it's quite repetitive. 
but by stitching this together all the way around again, we're going to ensure that the inner layer, the lining, and the outer layer, the shell, aren't going to separate around the edges when we try and bend this around to wear it. Also notice as a result, it's getting a little bit more bulky and a little bit more difficult for me to push through the machine, but gotta love the Singer Heavy Duty, it's done all of this without complaining so far. Once the lining was in, it's time to close up the edges of this thing. Now, I could have planned ahead and given myself a, a seam allowance all the way around, which I could have then clipped the corners, pressed under, and finished off in a usual way. But I'm a big fan of bias-bound edges when it comes to fantastical or science fiction-y type costumes. It also means I don't have to be particularly neat when I'm putting together lots and lots of layers like this. I can just stitch them all together and know that however I've attached them, it's going to be hidden later. Knowing that I wanted roughly half an inch of bias binding showing on the outside facing of this vest, I cut strips of the same denim that the shell is made out of, but I cut them at two inches wide so I could fold them in half, half them again, and I'd have my half inch bias binding. I could have used shop-bought bias binding, it's certainly unusual to bind edges with something as thick as this denim that I'm using, but I wanted it to exactly match the colour of the vest itself. I really wanted the stitch line just to be a detail rather than an accent colour. One thing I did differently on this project was rather than just cut one long strip of bias binding to go all the way around the vest itself, was to cut sections of bias binding, and you can see it while I'm pinning it together here. So each individual strip together at their ends with a little bit of a seam allowance in there so that I could press them out, and then went around attaching them all the way around the front of the vest. Now you'll notice here that I'm actually hand stitching this bias binding on. I think I finally reached the limit of what my machine was happy with going through, in terms of sheer number of layers. So I glued this bias binding into place and then set about hand stitching it together with a needle, thread and a pair of pliers. Once I had completed attaching the front section of the bias binding, that's the front lower edge, the left and right side and the front of the armholes on either side, it was back to the ironing board and a pair of scissors and again just debulking the seams. As I mentioned, my sewing machine was starting to struggle to get through all of these layers, and given that I wanted these bias-bound edges to be top-stitched as well, to stand the best chance of getting through it, I was just taking out any extra layers that occurred when the bias binding was pressed and flipped over. And that's basically what the next step involved, going around making sure to debulk where I could good hot iron trying to get all of this bias binding to sit as flat as I could. That was going to be imperative to when the piece was flipped over and we start attaching it on the back. Also really important here to remember to clip the curved seams. They're not going to be working in the same way that they would if they were part of a sleeve, but it's just nice to have that extra little bit of movement if you need it because we're going to be bending a straight piece of fabric backwards across a compound curve. And when it comes to the inside, it's just a case of basically doing the reverse of what we did on the front. Now, I'm not normally a big fan of gluing elements when you're sewing. I prefer to stitch things because you know that stitching is going to survive things like washing or repeated wear. But in situations like this where I already knew my sewing machine was going to start to struggle to get through it, I kind of reluctantly thought, yeah, I'm going to have to stick some of this down. So it was a case of folding under the excess bias binding and just trying to match that edge up to roughly where the stitch line was when I applied it to the front. And here we are using the heretical glue. Can't say I like it, but it's a lot faster. You can see at the top of the screen there, that's the lower front edge of the vest and that piece has already been glued and pressed into place and I'm just doing the same now on this side opening. It's just a case of applying glue to the inside facing, so the lining piece, and then also to the bias binding itself and pressing it down into place. This is a heat activated glue. Um, it's a very cheap one I bought from a local hobby store. 
Um, I think it was a couple of pounds for the tube and it really is a solid glue. Once all of the bias binding had been added and glued and pressed and was firmly in place, we ended up with this. And at this stage, I was pretty pleased with how this looked. Um, it's, it's quite clean. Uh, all of the lines are nicely pressed. Nothing is massively out of place. And I thought, hey, you know, that looks pretty good. I'm pretty pleased with this. And it was while I was pinning it onto the mannequin just to have a little bit of a look around just to make sure that the proportions were correct, none of the bias binding had come loose. I remembered that I really wanted this to be top stitched because I had a lot of stitching detail across the front and the back of the vest itself. And I thought it would look really good to have a decorative line of stitching going around the bias binding itself. Yeah, I thought, no problem. How hard could that be? Turns out it was really hard. So the problem I had wasn't that the sewing machine couldn't get through all those layers of denim and glue. The machine itself was absolutely fine, it would punch through it. The problem came from the thread I was using. It was just far too thin to keep up with the tension settings I'd need in order to do this by machine. So for better or for worse, I decided that I would go around each of these bias parts pretty much by eye, punching in each of these little holes for me to come back in and then hand sew later. Now, thanks to the number of layers of denim, plus all those layers of glue, the holes actually stayed open pretty well after I'd finished punching them. I just had to go slow and steady and to make sure to use a, a dedicated leather needle, a nice new sharp one, just to make sure it wasn't going to get caught on any of those layers as I was going around. From there it was time to break out the needle and thread and pretty much just do what was expected. It was going back through all of these pre-punched holes, pretty much just as a straight running stitch. I'd do it in one direction and then when I got to the end, turn around and sew back in the other direction. Similar way to how you would saddle sew leather, but I just did it one needle at a time, starting at one end and then finishing up at the other. Most of the time, I was fine just pushing this through by hand. However, I've got a pair of pliers there with me as well just for when the holes had started to close up or if there was a little bit too much glue and I couldn't quite get the needle through by hand, in which case it was just a matter of sewing by hand where I could and using the pliers when it got a little bit too tough. Now, as you can imagine, this took a long time. I mean, it would have taken minutes to run a stitch round on the machine if I was able to, but doing this by hand when each individual stitch was four to five millimeters in length, there were a lot of evenings spent sewing very, very small amounts of fabric. Still, I persevered and after a couple of weeks of spending half an hour to an hour each evening just going around the whole thing, I finally had the bias binding finished. And it's probably that pedantic thing I have for whenever I make something, but I think it looks so much better with that extra line of stitching in there. It was on to designing some kind of way of closing this vest down the sides and I ended up going with push studs. Initially I'd planned to have the studs attached to wide pieces of elastic that would then allow the vest to contract or expand as needed, but they're not allowed by certain costume groups, you can't have any visible elastic, so I ended up having to go with a solid piece instead. I figured this shouldn't be too much of a problem for me. The vest pattern itself was actually designed to fit me, so it was pretty much on the size where it needed to be. So after marking out roughly where I wanted these snaps to attach, I went about attaching them to the sides of the front and the back of the vest, ready to design some kind of clasp that would go in between, which would allow me just quick access on either or both sides. My initial idea for these was simply to take some more of the shell fabric, the dyed thinner denim that I'd used, layer it up a couple of times, uh, stitch it around the edges, maybe use a little bit of glue to stiffen it up a little bit, and then attach the opposite side to these press studs. And it'd be a nice, simple, quick way of getting a closure down the side. Bearing in mind I was gonna have to make six of these, so whatever I did was gonna be replicated six times. Nice and easy, I thought, so it was straight back to the fabric and marking out some pieces that would eventually be pressed and folded back on themselves so that they would generate a two inch wide strip. It's a fairly arbitrary amount, I just thought it looked about right given that there were going to be three on each side. 
So it was just a case of cutting out these lengths of fabric, getting them pressed flat and all of a uniform size so that I could make one of these straps just to see how it was going to go on. So I marked up the center lines, got out the iron and started folding them to see how it would look. I also thought I'd try and be terribly clever because I knew the distance between the front half and the back half press studs so I thought I'll mark these out in such a way that I can attach them and have them be invisible once the strap itself had been completed. So confident was I in fact that without really checking my numbers I thought well I'll just get on with it I'll make one as a test. This was actually a lot narrower than they ended up being. I think this strap is only around an inch wide. But I thought I'll just get it on the sewing machine, I'll record it and it'll be a nice little moment when I get this finished and I can just present it to the camera and say look, see, that worked out well. Unfortunately I forgot to take into account that I'd been doing this for quite some time and although I knew that my finished strap needed to be a certain length and the distance between the two press studs had to be, I think it was 120mm, when I'd finished marking it all up I got things a little bit arse end backwards and ended up completely screwing it up. So I went as far as to measure out where these press studs needed to go. Everything got glued in place so it wouldn't move. Then they were sewn in by hand with the idea being I could double the strap back on itself, turn it in the right way and you wouldn't see any of the stitching or the glue that was gonna be used to hold the press studs in place. What ended up happening was I sewed these two pieces so far from where they needed to be that not only was the whole thing useless, I just I couldn't even figure out where I'd gone wrong. So it was about then I decided to try and be a little less clever, maybe do things a little bit more straightforward and maybe avoid some of these mistakes again. Cue contemplative drumming of fingers as I wonder out if there's any way I can save this or if it's just going to be a bit of a write-off. Spoilers, it was a write-off. Back to the drawing board or ironing board in this case and it was just a matter of trying this again but keeping the construction a lot more simple. The plan this time around was to cut out two strips of my denim fabric fold them in on themselves and then put them back to back effectively giving me four layers of denim and hoping this would be a little bit more simpler way of constructing it but also something that would contain far less maths and I'd have a much easier time of getting it right than having to keep going back and correcting it and messing up again. Some pressing and some sewing and some application of press studs later I had this my first test strap. However, as soon as I'd finished this one, when I went to apply it, I, I could see the problem straight away. It just wasn't going to be thick enough. Because the flak vest itself had so many layers and so many stitching lines in it, it made the whole thing quite rigid. And with the connecting strap being so thin, it just looked really flimsy and the ends of it stuck out far too much. So I had to come up with a different solution and this is the original attempt I made and here is the final strap that I ended up settling with. Now this was made very differently to the initial strap, it was made a lot more closely to how the vest itself was made. In the centre of this there is a core of the heavyweight Bull Durham denim material that I'd used on the vest itself that was quilted and then had a layer of the thinner dyed denim put around the outside and it was actually glued in place as well for someone who hates glue it really saved this build. I then applied the same press studs to it and to cover those up because on the outside you would see the stitching I used these little pieces of decorative suede. They were just cut into little strips and individually glued on and once all of that had been done I just had to do it five more times. Nearly done now or so I thought at the time I got all my straps together and thought this was this is great I'm pretty much there now so let's just get these on see how it looks I was I was pretty happy with how it had all turned out so it was just a case of putting these on and seeing how it looked there was however a bit of an unforeseen problem well not really a problem just something that I hadn't really accounted for when I was putting this together and that was although these straps would keep the vest together at the front and back it wouldn't stop the sides sliding up and down against each other if there was any kind of movement. So if I were to bend forward, although I've got clearance at the waist, 
any additional pressure at the bottom would take everything out of line and you'd see it because the straps would move like that. That's the problem with having them on press studs is they are effectively just a place to rotate around. As it happens, the solution to this problem was something else that I absolutely hate when I'm making costumes and that is Velcro. Um, it's just it's just a bit of a bugbear to me. I don't like using Velcro as far as possible. I'd much rather use hooks and eyes or press studs or something that's a little bit less Velcro looking. By this point in the build though, I'd been hand sewing and gluing and working on this for, I think it was about six weeks. So I just decided, bite the bullet, use Velcro. It's gonna be in that overlap part anyway, so no one's really gonna see it, especially with the, the straps in place, everything's gonna be held together, and there's really no danger of this being seen. So breaking out my other most hated items when sewing, the glue, it was the double threat of glue and Velcro on the inside of each of these overlaps, just to give a small crossover spot. It wouldn't need to be much, and certainly these two lines of Velcro wouldn't completely align when the vest was closed. There just needed to be an inch or two of overlap, just so it would grip together and the two sides wouldn't slide against each other. And it worked. After giving the glue and the Velcro some time to dry, it was just a matter of closing up both of the sides to make sure the vest looked like I wanted it to when it was closed, and then it would be time to move on to the next part of this project. So there we go, just over six weeks worth of drafting, cutting, gluing, stitching, stitching, and more stitching. And, and honestly, I'm pretty happy with how it came out. It's got that sort of plate vest kind of look to it with that modern military aesthetic, but hopefully it's Star Wars-y enough to convey the character that I'm trying to build. It's a bit of a longer video this time, guys, so thank you for sticking with it if you've made it this far. If there's any questions or anything else you'd like me to explain, then just drop a comment below. And we're gonna be moving on to the pouches next then on to the hard parts of the armour itself. If you'd like to stay up to date with this project, please consider subscribing. Either way, I'll see you in the next video. Cheers all.